Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this May edition of the Brexit webinar of the Freight Transport Association. Um, so my colleague Sarah Lawadi and I, uh, both from the Brussels office of FTA, are going to take you through this webinar. So what we are going to cover today uh, includes an update on the stages of negotiations, um, some uh, reminder about the various customs options being discussed for the future, um, and proposals from the UK side, and how this is perceived in Brussels and elsewhere, and where the debate is going. Um, a bit of an update on other border controls, because borders are not just about customs. Um, with then an update uh, by Sarah on the haulage bill and options for road haulage, um, as well as the ongoing consultation uh, from, from the UK government. Um, and we will finish with a session on how can companies prepare for Brexit and what you can do, basically, to make sure you're in the best possible position. So before we start with the content, uh, just a few house rules um, as a reminder. Please keep your microphone and telephone muted. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, as usual, and the recording will be made available on the FTA website. I'm sorry to say that we are not going to be able to deal with any technical issues you might be experiencing during the webinar. Um, however, you will be able to follow it later on once it's published online uh, in the next few days. Um, if you have a question, you can use the chat box to ask any questions throughout the webinar. Um, and if there's any questions that are not answered, we'll try and collect them in the system. Um, and if not, you can, of course, uh, always send us an email and uh, you'll see my, my email address uh, later on towards the end of the webinar in case you want to drop me a line. OK, so where, where are we now in the negotiations? So the last sort of big milestone in the negotiations was the uh, EU Council uh, of the 22nd and 23rd of March. Um, where parts of the Rizal Agreement were finalized. Uh, this is essentially the divorce treaty. So these parts relate primarily to the rights of EU and UK citizens, um, to the financial settlement, um, as well as other matters, such as what happens to goods uh, in transit at the time of Brexit, uh, from a customs point of view. A political agreement was also reached on a 21 month transition period that would last until the end of 2020. Um, and the text on this has been pretty much locked uh, in the Wizard Agreement. But I stress political agreement because the only way this transition can actually happen is if the treaty, the Wizard Treaty, uh, is finalized and then ratified. Um, the EU27 leaders have also adopted a set of guidelines on what their expectation is and what this, their desires are in terms of the future relationship with the UK, both in terms of trade, transport, customs, um, as well as other matters such as security. Um, and talks on the Wizard Agreement and the Irish Protocol are ongoing. The Irish Protocol is the part of the Wizard Agreement that deals specifically with the issue of cooperation on the island of Ireland, including uh, the issue of the Irish border. Talks on the future relationship uh, have just started. Well, in fact, they started a few weeks ago, but there hasn't been um, huge progress yet. Um, they've mainly focused on um, how to organize the different discussions um, and what uh, the sort of overall structure for the future agreements could look like. The next big milestone, the next deadline, if you want, is the um, European Council of June at the end of June. So it's in about a month and a half now. Um, and that's where hopefully we'll see further progress, um, especially on the withdrawal treaty and especially on the issue of Ireland. However, I want to stress that the prospect of no deal still remains on the table. We can't completely exclude it at this stage. So this slide, which is um, unfortunately quite busy, um, is actually something I've borrowed from Michel Barnier. Uh, so Michel, Michel Barnier, the chief EU negotiator um, on 
on Brexit, responsible for Brexit negotiations from the EU side, presented this slide uh, to EU affairs ministers of the 27 remaining countries uh, on the 14th of May, and he also presented it to the European Parliament steering group on the 15th of May. Uh, so it's quite a recent uh, slide, and what it does is that it outlines essentially what the EU think is feasible and possible in terms of the various options for the future relationship, um, what kind of topics would be discussed, as well as the structure. So a list of topics was, was released, in fact, at the, the beginning of May, um, and you can see that uh, mainly sort of reflected in this on this slide. Um, I, I guess that the most important pillars for us will be the first and the second one, the one on the free trade agreement, um, as well as the one on socio-economic cooperation. Uh, why? Well, because the free trade agreement pillar is likely to contain provisions related to market access, customs cooperation, all the issues in terms of um, no tariffs, no quotas, all the uh, sort of non-tariff barriers um, issues, regulatory issues, um, as well as a framework for regulatory cooperation. And this is also where uh, sanitary and phytosanitary matters would be, would be discussed. Um, so it says CETA-like. CETA is the trade agreement between the EU and Canada. Um, this is, in fact, just an example because there are others that could be used as, as models. Um, but the intention from the EU side was to point out that this is very different from what, uh, say, Switzerland or Norway uh, are enjoying because of um, um, some, some things that they are ready to accept um, that the UK would not at this stage anyway. Um, then the second pillar on socio-economic cooperation will be important for us because that's where the transport services are likely to fall. Um, so this is an interesting indication that transport might, after all, not necessarily be technically part of the free trade agreement. Um, this could be good news uh, in the sense that we could hope for a slightly quicker agreement on transport than some other matters. Uh, but yeah, this is just a very, very preliminary assessment. Um, as you can see, this, there would also be a point on mobility of citizens. So we can expect that the EU side will want to discuss um, the arrangements for the mobility of citizens that are not resident uh, at the time of Brexit or during the transition period um, under, under this particular framework. Uh, note that it says transport services and not aviation. Um, so aviation, of course, will be part of this, but not just aviation, also road transport, uh, we anticipate, and probably also rail. So just as a sort of summary, um, here's where we are in terms of the state of clear negotiations. Discussions are still ongoing on the withdrawal arrangements, uh, but it's mainly on Ireland, uh, in fact, as well as the governance of the entire treaty. Um, Ireland, I guess, is the part where um, there's most disagreement between the two camps at this stage. And I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, discussions on the transition or implementation period um, is, uh, has been completed. The talks have been completed and they've reached an agreement. However, it's very much contingent on the withdrawal agreement ratification. So without a withdrawal agreement, uh, there will not be a legal base uh, for, for, for this transition. This is very much the message that Michel Barnier um, has, been, has been sharing uh, with all stakeholders as well as the UK side. Uh, discussions on the framework for the future relationship uh, is indeed ongoing, but at this stage it's very much preliminary preparatory discussions, um, as I explained, as to the structure of the talks and the future agreements. They haven't actually started uh, digging into the details, um, and it's not absolutely certain to which extent they'll be able to do that in the next few weeks. The comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU, just as a reminder, uh, will only be finalized and concluded post-Brexit. So in terms of the transition, and again, this is, this is a reminder, um, there was a political agreement on that um, in, in March. Uh, it's just a political agreement because it's not something which is yet set in stone or binding. 
Um, the idea is that essentially you'd have a status quo during the transition period, so until the end of 2020, um, especially from a UK-EU point of view. So the UK would remain in the single market and the customs union. There would be no transport restrictions during that time. Um, you'd have a status quo for uh, all matters related to insurance law uh, or recognition of qualifications, for instance. Um, and in return, of course, the UK uh, would accept to implement in full and apply all EU rules, including new ones that would only be adopted during the transition slash implementation period. Um, so this is for the UK EU uh, side of things. Um, however, there is still a slight question mark regarding um, agreements between the EU and third countries. Uh, trade agreements, of course, but also other types of agreements, such as, for instance, the aviation agreement between the US and the EU. Um, the EU has agreed to sort of notify its partners that the UK should be treated like a member state uh, for all intent and purpose during this transition period. Um, but of course, it's in their guise to accept or, or, or reject this. Um, so we'll just have to um, wait and see how, how, how this evolves. But at least the promise from the EU that they would notify their partners makes um, any rejection more unlikely uh, from third countries. Um, the biggest uh, difficulty, I guess, however, is that there's no transition without a withdrawal treaty. And therefore, at this stage, the transition is not 100% uh, secure and uncertain. And why is that? Well, uh, the, one, one of the big stumbling blocks, as I explained, is the issue of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Now, if you don't have any operations on the island of Ireland or between Northern Ireland and the Republic, you might think that this is not necessarily something that concerns you. Um, however, the implications for this are huge um, because this needs to be part of a specific protocol on Ireland, which is, in fact, part of the withdrawal treaty. Um, and the EU insists on this being ratified uh, through the withdrawal treaty at the same time as other provisions related to um, EU and UK citizens' rights, for instance, um, or indeed the transition. So there were three options that were agreed back in December uh, between the UK government and uh, EU negotiators. Uh, the first one was to try and find a solution to make sure there would be no hard border through the entire EU-UK relationship. Um, this is both the UK government as well as uh, uh, Irish government, as we understand, uh, preferred option. Then um, the uh, plan B would be other solutions whereby technology would facilitate and make borders much, much more seamless. Um, and that um, would be pushed um, to the point where essentially there would be no um, any type of uh, hard infrastructure at the border. Um, this is considered slightly tricky, however, uh, because even cameras, for instance, uh, additional cameras, uh, would um, uh, in fact uh, be in breach of this, of this particular promise that there will be no hard border. Um, so that's, that's a solution which is now becoming a, a little bit more difficult, shall we say. And then the last one is the uh, backstop option. Uh, the backstop option is like an insurance policy, um, especially from the uh, uh, Irish and EU point of view. And it's really the last resort uh, in case everything else fails. Um, the EU proposed uh, a while back a specific backstop option whereby there would be a common regulatory area on the island of Ireland um, and Northern Ireland would also remain part of the EU customs union. Um, EU VAT and excise rules would also apply to Northern Ireland, um, but all of this wouldn't apply to Great Britain. Um, so this option was rejected by Theresa May several times very strongly because it would have created a hard border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, so this is not something which is um, considered acceptable by the UK government uh, or indeed by, by DUP uh, in Northern Ireland. 
uh, and has therefore been rejected by the UK side. Work is now ongoing still on another backstop option um, and there wasn't much progress on this lately um, until until reports, in fact, um, in the last in the last few weeks, that the UK was trying to um, find a solution through a new customs partnership um, or, or or some kind of alternative uh, customs relationship. And I'll come back to that in a in a few minutes. Uh, but this was just focused on on customs, uh, of course. So it didn't really solve the issue of uh, of regulation, uh, for instance, and regulation related checks. Uh, there have been talks as well uh, yesterday afternoon and this morning, uh, reports in the press of a possible new option that would be proposed by the uh, UK government uh, as an alternative to the EU backstop. Um, however, I want to stress that we have not seen anything official or formal from the UK government on this. This is just reports from the press at, at this stage. Um, and also that nothing has been agreed. Uh, so even if that were indeed the official UK government position, we have absolutely no idea at this stage as to how uh, the Irish government um, or the EU negotiators or indeed the remaining uh, 26 member states uh, will, will react and whether this is something that will be felt um, to be an acceptable option. Um, what would this um, alleged UK proposal um, say well essentially it would work as a sort of longer customs transition um, whereby uh, the government would buy a bit of time to implement one or the other of their customs solutions and in the meantime the whole of the UK would pretty much remain in the in the customs union um, we really need to see a tangible proposal it's difficult to comment on this until we until we do um, but as I said, we're not sure this will be acceptable by the other side. Um, and most importantly, it would not actually remove completely the need for checks at the borders because most checks at the borders are not customs related. So this is in no way um, an absolute and definite solution uh, to, the, to, the, to the problem of the border on the island of Ireland. Uh, but we'll have to see because as I said, these are just uh, rumors reported by the press at this stage. Um, the deadline set by the EU side and Ireland uh, for at least tangible progress on this issue is the uh, next EU Council at the end of June. Um, this is not an absolute deadline because, uh, in fact, October is the more absolute deadline. However, if uh, there's still no progress on this, uh, this could really put at risk uh, future, future discussions on the future relationship. So what can we expect and when? Um, we can expect uh, sometime before March 2019 a legally binding withdrawal agreement with a protocol on Ireland. Um, and attached to that, there would be a non-binding political agreement on the framework for the future relationship that would hopefully uh, be as detailed as possible and describe the intention of the two sides in terms of what the future relationship should look like. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will be sufficiently detailed, however. Um, then hopefully, if this is all agreed, there would be a transition period uh, until the end of 2020. Um, and after that, hopefully, a new comprehensive free trade agreement and related arrangements. So um, this is where we are in terms of progress with the, with the negotiations. Now, um, as I mentioned, there have been a lot of discussions within the UK government and within the so-called Brexit uh, World Cabinet on uh, customs arrangements. Um, and essentially what they've been discussing were the two proposals uh, that were presented uh, back, back in August uh, of last year. Um, so from, from, a, from a UK perspective, I mean, that would be uh, three options that uh, HMRC and others are preparing for. Um, the uh, highly streamlined customs arrangements, which is essentially a basket of simplification measures, uh, some which would have to be negotiated with the EU, others unilateral. Um, this is a tested approach, but it would take time uh, to, be, to be implemented, um, and critics wonder whether that would actually deliver um, the seamless flows and borders that have been that have been promised to, to industry. Um, 
The second option is the uh, so-called new customs partnership, where we would be aligning our approach to the customs border in a way that removes the need for a UK-EU uh, customs border. One potential approach would involve the UK mirroring the EU's requirements for imports uh, from the rest of the world, where their final destination is the EU. Uh, this is, however, uh, critics say an untested approach, um, could be bad on some on industry, because you'd have to track everything, uh, potentially, and could also be burdensome um, on other countries, because in order to work, you would probably have to work both ways uh, for goods going out of the UK, but also for goods entering uh, the UK. And then there's another scenario that both sides are still preparing for, which is no deal, uh, where the UK is a third country with no particular customs agreement of any kind. Um, all these options have raised some questions with regard to uh, Northern Ireland and the border on Ireland. Um, and um, in fact, uh, the conclusion of discussions so far in the in the World Cabinet, as we as we understand, is that uh, none of the options as presented, exactly as presented, would be able to uh, deliver a smooth border on the island of Ireland um, in time. So by uh, by December 2020. Um, so this is the various customs options. Um, now, what's really important to remember is that uh, border controls are not only customs related, and there are many, many other agencies, many other functions, um, some of which with actually much higher percentages of checks um, that have a role to play uh, potentially at the border, uh, hopefully not in the future, but uh, by, 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 by default, I mean, this is pretty much the, the, the list of checks and things that could happen at the border or near the border. Um, and as you can see, customs is just uh, one, one, one part. Uh, you also have to factor into this all the product testing, uh, conformity checks and so on, um, all the uh, uh, agricultural, uh, so phytosanitary, uh, veterinary sanitary checks um, and so on. Um, as well as uh, things related to uh, licenses um, uh, or uh, all the security controls um, and potentially also transport controls in order to check whether or not uh, a vehicle uh, can cross the border, the company has got the right to operate across the border or the driver has the right qualifications. Um, and one specific area, which is uh, particularly problematic, uh, in fact, is the issue of sanitary and phytosanitary checks. Uh, by default, unless some kind of agreement is found, uh, for instance, like the agreement that Switzerland has with the EU, um, there would be systematic checks on imports uh, into the EU, so UK exports, uh, including, of course, movements between Ireland and the UK. Um, and that would at least involve documents and identity checks. Identity checks are when uh, the seal on a container will be checked, the reference number will be checked against the uh, health certificate to make sure that all of this is fine. Uh, we've been told that this could take uh, at least between 10 and 15 minutes uh, per, per shipment. Um, so which products are concerned? Well, anything from meat, fish, uh, seafood and dairy products. Uh, by the way, for, for, for meat, if you have uh, things like noodles with a little bit of meat or a sauce for pasta with just a little bit of meat, it will also fall under that category. Um, honey, wool, um, and then for the uh, phytosanitary checks, fruits, vegetables, plants, flowers, things like that. Um, and perhaps more surprisingly for some of you, um, wood as well, uh, including things like pallets, uh, for instance, that would be used um, in the in the transportation. Uh, so this is something which is quite um, tough to solve, as I as I mentioned, because the checks would typically happen in specific uh, posts at the at the border. Uh, EU law actually sets a minimum percentage of checks that would have to happen which is much higher than, let's say, for customs. Um, and a lot of agreements that exist with the EU only reduce the number of physical checks, but not the number of so-called identity checks, which in fact are just another sort 
uh, of physical checks. That's the checking the seal or the reference number, for instance, as I as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is something that will really need, need to be to be solved, and we are pushing very strongly uh, with the UK government as well as uh, uh, the task force and um, authorities on the other side of the channel uh, to see if solutions can can be found uh, to have these checks somewhere else than at the border or avoid them completely. Uh, I will now hand over to Sarah to uh, take you through the parts on road transport. Thank you, Pauline. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, in a previous webinar that some of you may have followed a few months ago, we already addressed the, uh, the question of road transport market access. And today I would like to, to update you on the latest developments uh, in this area. Uh, so first, a few reminders on the context, on the context and on the main challenges. Um, the conditions under which lorries will be allowed to cross the borders after Brexit, uh, be it between the UK and the continent or between the UK and Republic of Ireland, will depend on the outcome of Brexit negotiations. Uh, the default situation, uh, in case there is uh, no better agreement, is that the community license uh, issued by, by the UK would no longer be valid uh, in the EU27 post-Brexit. Uh, so regarding the situation, there are different options uh, to, address, uh, to address that, uh, different options that could be uh, considered in the negotiations. I'll take, I'll take you through uh, these options. And the first one, uh, the most favorable, favorable one, is uh, would be a liberalized system uh, in which uh, operator licenses issued by the UK would be recognized on the EU27 and vice versa. And in that case, lorries would be allowed to cross the borders into Ireland or into mainland Europe freely uh, and vice versa, uh, which is the closest to the status quo. So this option of a liberalized system requires a road transport agreement uh, or a wider agreement uh, between the, the UK and the EU in which transport would be, would be addressed. This is the first option. The second option uh, would be a permit system with qualitative criteria, but no volume restrictions, so without quotas. That would imply some administra administrative procedures, but it would preserve um, the ability to, to cope with the, the volume of goods. Um, this option, uh, this option too, requires a, an agreement with, between the UK and the EU, uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, there is still uncertainty on, on the first two options. Um, a, a third option would be a permit system, but this time with volume restrictions, so with quotas. That would be the, the main difference with uh, the previous option I, I presented. Uh, and a permit system with quotas could either be a completely new bespoke system or something based on uh, existing procedures. Uh, a, a, new, a new system would require uh, an agreement as well, uh, or several agreements, bilateral agreements, between the UK and the, the different EU member states. Uh, and uh, some question marks would remain for example, regarding uh, what we call cross-trade, regarding uh, transport between, um, uh, not between the, the UK and uh, an EU27 member state, but between two different uh, EU, EU member states where the UK is not involved. Um, the other possibility regarding a permit system with quota is to rely on uh, the existing EC, ECMT permit system. Uh, which is uh, a system under OECD uh, based on uh, an existing multilateral agreement. Uh, this option is the only one that does not depend on, on negotiation outcome. Uh, we know that it will be available anyway. Um, so, uh, of course, ECMT permits, uh, as we mentioned in previous webinars, come with uh, very, important, very important limitations and restrictions. Uh, first and foremost on the number of permits available uh, and this is one of the reasons why it is not a satisfactory solution. Um, I will not go into the details of ECMT this time but if you have questions on how it works uh, please do contact us. 
I would just like to underline that, of course, uh, FTA is pushing for a UK-EU road transport agreement or land transport agreement uh, to allow lorries to go back and forth between, uh, between the UK and the EU27 without restrictions. Uh, we had reassurance that the UK government is also seeking to have a system without volume restrictions and with as little red tape as possible. However, as I said, there is an, an element of uncertainty with all options, but the one which doesn't depend on the negotiation. So you may know that the road haulage permit bill that was introduced in February um, is a contingency uh, in case negotiations do not deliver a fully liberalized system without permits. And I'm going to uh, update you on, on, well, first to remind you of uh, what the bill is and update you on the, the latest developments. Uh, so basically, the, the bill gives the Department for Transport the powers to allocate permits in any scenario that would imply rationing, in any scenario with, uh, with permits. Uh, it is a framework bill which means that uh, not everything is detailed and uh, defined uh, in the text. And criteria for the allocation of permits will be defined in secondary legislation at a later stage, uh, which explains why the bill uh, remains very open on, on what criteria might be used. Um, a few words, uh, a, few, uh, a few more points on, uh, on uh, a potential permit system. Uh, we had confirmation, confirmation recently that the setup cost of such a permit system would be covered by public money as part of a grant from uh, the Treasury to the Department for Transport for Brexit preparations. However, uh, running the system will have a cost, uh, running the system uh, on a day to day basis. And that is why the bill allows the Department for Transport to introduce a fee for permit, for permit application. Uh, we understand that this fee should only aim at recovering the cost of the day-to-day -day management of the scheme and not the initial set of cost, which is covered by, by public money. Um, the government has not put a figure on, on, uh, on the, uh, the application for a permit yet. Uh, an indication could be the fee for a permit currently issued by the UK to go to some non-EU countries, which is uh, currently 133 pounds, uh, but there is no reason why the, the, the future application fee should be exactly the same uh, if a permit system has to apply to, to transport to or from uh, the EU post Brexit. Our assessment uh, of this option is that a permit system is not a suitable solution. Uh, we see various risks and various reasons why uh, it's not a suitable, a suitable uh, solution. Uh, the first one is that uh, the application system could be cumbersome for all years, um, and this would not, uh, not be uh, satisfactory. Uh, the, the second reason is that the validity period of permits may not match the duration of transport contracts, uh, which usually lasts several years. Uh, based on how uh, existing permit systems work with non-EU countries, we expect permits to be valid for maybe one year. So this poses a real problem uh, compared to the, the, the duration of transport contracts, which uh, could be three or five years. It means that the transport operator may be allocated a permit for year one, but perhaps not for the following year, even though it is bound by a contract with, a, with its customer. So, of course, that would be uh, a major problem both for operators and for freight buyers. Uh, and last point, eventually, uh, depending on the, the outcome of the negotiation, uh, we could end up either with uh, notional permits without volume restrictions or uh, a, a worse solution with quotas. And this risk that the number of permits could be limited and insufficient uh, to cover the transport needs is not something that the industry can, can accept and not something that you know, we, FTA, can accept. So given these risks, uh, it is extremely important that road transport is prioritized in negotiations so that there can be a land transport agreement 
securing liberalised access to the road transport market access. We've been engaging at all relevant levels to, to address these points, and I'll give you a few examples of the meetings and uh, the actions we took uh, to, uh, to, to push these points. Um, first, uh, on the UK side, we have had bilateral meetings with the Department for Transport. We also uh, participated in uh, two different workshops organized by the FT uh, in London and Birmingham uh, in March. We also engaged uh, with uh, members of the parliament uh, to make sure that uh, the, the concerns and the interests of uh, the industry are known and taken into account um, through the, the, the procedure uh, in, the, in the Houses of the Parliament. Uh, we had meetings with uh, various MPs and we also uh, briefed uh, the, the transport team and the Brexit, the Brexit team of the opposition uh, so that the, the Shadow Secretary of State for Transport and the Shadow Secretary of State uh, for ex exiting the EU are well aware of the concerns I explained just before and uh, to make sure that um, uh, the interests of the industry are taken into account. Uh, a few words now on our engagement uh, on the EU side. Uh, we had uh, various meetings with the task force of Michel Barnier and in each of these meetings we stressed uh, the challenges related to uh, road transport market access because uh, customs are uh, discuss at length and uh, uh, customs concerns are well known. Uh, we had uh, a feeling that uh, transport specific questions were not as high on the agenda as we would have liked. So we pressed this point several times. We also had meetings with European civil servants in charge of transport. Um, FTA was also present and uh, speaking uh, in various conferences for example, uh, one that took place in Warsaw on road college and Brexit, and this point uh, of uh, road transport market access was mentioned. Uh, and uh, as you may know, we also organized a parliamentary conference in Brussels uh, on the 7th of March, where we had more than 120 attendees from the industry, from uh, the EU institutions, uh, from some uh, national institutions as well. Uh, and um, the, the question of liberalised access to uh, road transport markets uh, post-Brexit was one, was one of the points we really wanted to, to, to highlight and it was um, high on the agenda of, of this conference. So this is what we have been doing to advance the interests of the industry. Uh, and now I would like to, to update you on the progress of the bill in the Parliament and on the last debate that took place in the House of Commons uh, a few days ago. Uh, as you know, the bill was introduced in February and it made its way uh, in the House of Laws with the final stage uh, in the House of Laws completed in late March. Uh, it then went to the House of Commons where the first debate uh, took place uh, on, on Monday this week. Uh, so, um, some of you may have followed the debate, uh, if not, uh, well, the, the main points, uh, there are a few points on which I, I would like to insist. Uh, first, the, the Secretary of State, Chris Grayling, gave reassurance that the government is committed to, to maintaining the liberalised access for commercial college, which is a good signal because this is also uh, our preferred option. He confirmed that there would be guidance for hauliers on the allocation process, even though the intention is to work towards uh, a solution that makes uh, a permit system and guidance on the permit system superfluous. We were also pleased to hear that several MPs made references to the needs of the industry, uh, references to just-in-time just supply chains and to the importance of uh, road market access and rural for the economy on both sides of the channel. Um, and some MPs whom uh, FTE had briefed voiced uh, our concerns, our concerns that the provisions of the bill do not constitute a suitable solution as it would not respond to the, the transport needs. 
So it is fair to say that there is a strong understanding that a transport agreement is needed between the EU and the UK. And these are positive signals, uh, but it is now crucial that they are translated into concrete steps uh, in the negotiations. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the bill will continue its progress in the House of Commons. The next step will be uh, a line-by-line -line examination on the 5th of June during the committee stage where uh, MPs will have the opportunity to make changes and to, to add uh, new provisions. On top of the bill, uh, which is just a, a framework bill, there will be secondary legislation uh, to define uh, criteria uh, for permit allocation. And actually, a consultation on secondary legislation was launched uh, yesterday. Uh, it is mainly about the criteria that could be uh, used to allocate permits. Uh, and the government is considering a number of them, uh, ranging from um, uh, the, in the intensity of use uh, of a permit based on how frequently operators uh, carry out international transport operations, uh, to um, the type of commodities uh, transported, or uh, the, also the, the, the size of the company, or um, um, the, the, the weight of, of vehicles. So really, uh, the, we see from the, the consultation documents that uh, TFT is really seeking views on a number of options, a number of possible criteria, and um, it is actually uh, clear from the list of criteria that uh, none of these could mm, be uh, could could provide a, a, a suitable solution, and nothing would uh, be as close as uh, as close to what we need as um, a transport agreement uh, that would ensure liberalised access. So um, the consultation uh, is open until uh, uh, the 20th of June. Um, we will uh, respond. There will be an FTA submission. If you want to send us input, please uh, do contact us. Do contact me, and I will uh, get in touch with you uh, to uh, to um, include your points in, uh, in the FTA submission. Uh, last point on um, on the bill: uh, the government still aims at making uh, a permit scheme operational by the end of the year, should such a, a permit system be needed. So I will now uh, uh, give the floor to, to Pauline to, uh, to brief you on how you can prepare and what you can do. Uh. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, you, you've heard a little bit of the, the state of play and where we are, um, as well as some areas where government has already started to think about uh, very practical implementation and practical stages, uh, including criteria for allocating permits for trucks. Um, so these criteria, by the way, are very important uh, because it would mean that uh, the companies that actually match the criteria would be able to operate across borders, while the ones that don't might no longer have access to the EU market, uh, including Ireland. And by the way, I wish to stress that uh, any arrangements restricting access to UK trucks to the EU um, would also restrict access uh, of EU trucks to the UK. So this is very important to, to bear in mind. So how can you prepare and what are the ideas worth considering? We, we cannot stress enough that you need to map out your processes, your flows, relationships with suppliers um, and service providers if you have not started to do so. Uh, so sometimes uh, Supply chains can be incredibly complex and there are very uh, many different layers of uh, companies and actors involved, uh, be it from the transport and logistics side or uh, as part of your production process. So it's very important that you not only look at your processes and your flows, but also uh, the ones of your partners and the ones that uh, make it possible for you to um, uh, keep your production on track uh, as well as the uh, deliveries. Uh, so this is this is the first step and really essential. So if you have not started doing that, you really need to do that now uh, without without delay. Um, you need to also start 
to understand the regulatory tax and human resources implications of Brexit uh, on your company. So how can you do that? Um, well, have a look at the uh, rules and regulations and appealing the specific products uh, that you either transport or produce or both. Um, and if necessary, talk to your uh, sectoral trade associations to better understand the impact and how third countries would be, would be treated. Um, understand the VAT implications as well as other tax related implications. And for human resources, uh, make sure to keep an eye on uh, uh, past webinars that we've had on uh, what would be included as part of the, the Resolve Agreement, as well as any updates on guidance from government. Um, but start by looking at uh, where areas where you employ uh, EU workers that are not Irish or UK nationals and see what's the percentage and, 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 and so on. Um, you need to review existing obligations as well as simplifications, uh, facilitation measures and special procedures available under the Union Customs Code. Uh, this is the uh, uh, sort of customs bible uh, for all the customs related procedures and rules uh, currently both for the UK and, and the EU. Um, and you need to look at what these obligations as well as uh, facilitations are like for a third country. Um, and there is a role that needs to be performed by all actors. So it's not just a matter for your freight forwarder or uh, customs agent. It's also a matter for shippers and it's also a matter for transport companies. So even if you uh, don't have much to do otherwise, as a transport company, you also have responsibilities under that. Um, you need to assess your level of exposure, uh, really understand um, what products um, need essentially components or ingredients that might come from the, from the EU or go through the EU. Um, and don't only think about it in trade terms, also in transport terms. Uh, look at the movement of goods, where your goods are um, going in order to reach their destination and whether there could be difficulties there. Really encourage your suppliers and service providers to do the same because, as I said, this is not just a matter uh, for your company, it's a matter for uh, the entire chain for each of your products. So all of this is already pretty time consuming, so that's why you need to really start doing it now uh, if you want to have a chance to, uh, to, to be ready in time. Um, then further, further ideas, once you've done that, we would really recommend that you assess any training or recruitment needs, especially from a customs perspective. Um, you don't need to start recruitment necessarily now, but just make sure that you know exactly what you would be needing uh, once you decide to, to, to move and do it. Um, and if you want to increase the use of third parties, such as customs brokers, uh, you need to decide that um, as soon as possible. Uh, approach them if you can, see what would be feasible, what your options would be. And bear in mind uh, that customs brokers and freight forwarders might get saturated relatively quickly if everyone goes to them with huge uh, requests and, and demands and so on. Um, so it's always a wise thing to uh, think about uh, trying to do some of these things yourselves if you can. Um, we also recommend that you consider becoming uh, AU accredited. Um, so this is not necessarily something that will work for every company, um, but just so you know, um, this is something which is pretty much essential from a security perspective, AOS, AO security, uh, because generally all the parties in the chain uh, need to be accredited for this to, to, to work very well. Um, it would give you a lower risk score, uh, which is used to determine the frequency of customs, physical and documentary checks. Um, would allow in some cases your contactment to be fast tracked through customs controls. Um, however, that might require fast lanes. So uh, in, in the case of the Dover Strait, there might not be any space for that. So just to, just to bear in mind, um, it could give you reduced requirements for mandatory pre-arrival, pre-departure, uh, summary uh, declarations, should they be needed, um, and as well as um, um, access potentially to uh, reciprocal arrangements on the EU side um, should uh, a mutual recognition agreement for AU be negotiated by the UK. Um, AU customs is perhaps a bit trickier because you need to 
demonstrate a very high degree of compliance and training as well, undergo specific training. Um, so this might be a bit more difficult, but it could allow you to benefit from uh, faster application process for custom simplifications and authorizations, uh, reductions or waivers of guarantees, uh, especially if you want to use uh, special procedures. So this is it could be it could be quite uh, attractive in some cases. But if you want to use an intermediary, uh, we would advise that you check whether they are AOC accredited. Uh, we would uh, strongly encourage you to review your stock management options as well. Um, could you actually have more storage uh, space? Can that be integrated uh, both in your production and delivery processes? Uh, might not be necessarily applicable for all products. Some which rely on just-in-time, it will be very difficult, but try to see exactly um, where and when this is possible and what this would entail both in legal terms, customs terms, as well as more physically, where actually would you be able to build one um, warehouse, for instance, if you, if you had to build a new one. Um, try to review your logistics contracts and consider options with your partners involve your partners and discuss with them what the various options could be, um, what your plan B could be, uh, at least for the first few months, should it ever come to that. Um, and of course, voice your concerns to government directly, as well as through FTA, and make sure you follow our webinars, sign up to the Brexit Digest if you're not already receiving it, and attend our events um, and seminars. Um, as a useful reminder, there are no changes uh, at the moment. The UK is still a member of the EU. All the same rules, the same penalties apply, and this will remain the case until uh, the 30th of March 2019, plus any possible transition period. So now is really the time to assess the impact of Brexit on your operations and to prepare contingency plans um, and backups. And in terms of, again, a useful reminder, a uh, list of forthcoming FTA events and activities. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you don't already receive the Brexit Digest, which is a weekly uh, newsletter that usually goes on Mondays, sometimes exceptionally on Tuesdays, uh, you can contact me and you can see my email address here um, in order to um, uh, get access to that. Um, we strongly encourage you um, as well to uh, uh, register for our Keep Britain Trading Conference um, in in uh, in London. Um, this is going to happen on the 20th of June. It will be very practical and focused on Brexit preparedness. So if you're not already registered, uh, please consider it because I think you'll get quite a lot out of it. We'll be able to go much more into details uh, than what we are able to do on webinars. Um, and then the next webinar will be on the 21st of, of June. Um, and after that, just to let you know that we're also considering organizing at some point in September um, some European Transport Manager seminars uh, where Brexit would not be the sole uh, focus, but could well be a, a big part of it, uh, specifically for road transport this time. So also worth considering for the future. And once this is fully decided and we have the dates, of course, we'll share this with you. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, uh, you can either enter them in the system now or you can drop me an email and we'll try to come back to you with an answer uh, relatively quickly. Um, and you can, of course, uh, follow us uh, on social media and check our website uh, for, for any updates. Um, and last reminder, yeah, please, if you have not registered yet, please consider registering for our conference on the 20th of June in central London. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day.